So thanks, Parthanilla, for the nice introduction. And also, I'd like to thank the organizers for this invitation. So <clears throat> today, I'll be talking on this strict monotonicity of principal eigenvalues of elliptic operators in RD and its application to this sensitive control. So it's a joint work with Anub Biswas, who is a faculty at Iser Pune, and Ari Arapostathis, who is a faculty at UT Austin. So there are many terminologies in the titles. Hopefully, things will be clear by the end of this talk. OK. So the <clears throat> central object of study is this operator, LF, which is an elliptic operator. So we are interested in what is called eigenvalue problems of this such elliptic operators. So when D is a smooth and bounded domain, and a, b, and f, so these coefficients have <coughs> are regular enough, then it is known that if you look at the eigenvalue problem uh, on this smooth bounded domain with Dirichlet boundary condition, that means zero on the boundary, then this operator has what is called a principal eigenvalue and a corresponding eigenfunction. All this follows from some standard theory called crane rootman theory. And this eigenvalue is basically the bottom of the spectrum of minus LF or the maximum eigenvalue of LF, the way uh, like if you don't want to take minus LF. Now, for so this was long time back for this is known <clears throat> for bounded domains, it was long, known for long time back. Now for unbounded domains, again, this kind of principal eigenvalue problem or in general eigenvalue problem has been studied very recently, I guess in 2016, by <coughs> Beresticki and Rossi. So now not surprisingly enough that certain properties which you get for principal eigenvalues in bounded domains may not be true for unbounded ones. For example, like when D is smooth and bounded, it is well known that for the, again, for the Dirichlet boundary value problem, the principal eigenvalue is simple. That means the corresponding eigenspace is one dimensional. And the associated principal eigenfunction is positive. That means you get an eigenfunction in the eigenspace, which is strictly positive. And it is the unique eigenvalue with that property. By that I mean, like if you take any other eigenvalue, which is not a principal eigenvalue, you will not get an eigenfunction in the eigenspace which is completely positive. It will be both positive and negative, fine? Now, <clears throat> when D becomes unbounded and smooth, so in bounded domain, we had this only one eigenvalue with such a property, and the eigenspace was one dimensional. Now, when it go to unbounded domain, but smooth unbounded domain, there exists a constant, so let's denote it by lambda star, which depends on lambda star f. So f was that other coefficient in the elliptic operator, says that if you take any lambda in this interval, lambda star to infinity, so starting greater than or equal to lambda star, so is an eigenvalue of LF with a positive eigenfunction. So now, so in bounded case, you had only a unique eigenvalue with a positive eigenfunction. Now you have a continuum of eigenvalues with a positive eigenfunction. And the lowest such lambda star serves as a definition for the principal eigenvalue when D is not unbounded. So the first thing here is, so now if I just give you an eigenpair, lambda, uh, an eigenpair, so an eigenvalue and an eigenfunction, now you cannot tell me if it is the principal eigenvalue or not because like there are these infinitely many eigenvalues corresponding to which there is a positive eigenfunction. So, how to recognize whether it is the smallest one or not is something that needs to be checked, uh, like needs to be done. So that's a question. Okay. Now, for bounded domains, it is known that the principal eigenvalue is a <coughs> strictly monotone function of the domain. That means and where you order the domains according to set inclusion. And also, it is strictly monotone in the coefficient f when the domain is bounded. That means if your f is strictly less than g, then lambda star f is strictly less than lambda star g. Now, this properties fail to hold in unbounded domains. Like one thing is like, so it may not be 
monotone in f. So, the strict monotonicity of this function f going to lambda star f is and what are its applications will be a central theme in today's talk. So, so already I have mentioned two things. One that how to actually recognize the principal eigenvalue because now there are a continuum of these eigenvalues with a positive eigenfunction unlike the bounded case and also like the strict monotonicity fails. So, in general, so when strict monotonicity holds, what are its implications? Yes, that's what, again, like for example, even in bounded domain, that's the way you do. So, so what Berestiki and Rossi did is like just defined it to be the, because now there, there was only single with that positive and like it was also the like bottom of the spectrum of minus LF, but here now it's, there are, a continuum, so you just define, the, they just defined it as the minimum of such eigenvalues. So, the, they just defined it. So, it's just Beresticky and Ross's definition. And also, it's like, I guess, pretty standard in PD literature. Okay, now, so first I'll start with the assumptions on the coefficients. Well, these assumptions of people who work with SD are pretty familiar assumptions. So, this sigma has to be what is called locally Lipschitz, and this B and sigma has to satisfy an affine growth condition. Again, as I said, these are pretty standard conditions. And this Aij, where A is half sigma sigma transpose. So, in, in the elliptic operator, we had this A, but here I gave an assumption on sigma. So, what is the sigma? It's basically the positive square root of A. So, <coughs> Yes, BR is the ball of radius R. So, A is that half sigma sigma transpose and this AIJ has to have this non-degeneracy condition. Again, in one way of uh, let's explaining this non-degeneracy is like the least eigenvalue is bounded away from zero uniformly over all x. If you like uniformly over all x in BR, that's the non-degeneracy condition. And now, if you are given a filtered probability space with right continuous filtration and all complete and let W be a standard Brownian motion adapted to that filtration Ft and if you consider this stochastic differential equation, then it is well known that under those assumptions A1 to A3 there exists a unique strong solution of the SD. So, again pretty standard and now a few definitions just I for completeness I have put this. So, let tau d denote the first exit time of the process x from a domain d. So, then the process x is said to be recurrent if you take any bounded domain and you start from any point which is outside d closure, then the hitting time of that domain is finite almost surely. Otherwise, the process is called transient. So, a recurrent process is said to be positive. No, so it's tau d complement and tau is exit time. Tau is exit, so it's uh, exit time of the, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, okay, so, <clears throat> and it's said to be positive recurrent if its mean hitting time is finite, and it is known for a non degenerate diffusion that if these definitions are independent of d and x, like for example, if it happens for some. Um, bounded domain D, then it happens for all D and for all X in D bar uh, complement and all. So, that's the definition. So, it's pretty similar to we have what we have for Markov chains like hitting uh, where like return time is finite, then it's recurrent. If it is mean return time is finite, positive recurrent and so on. So, it's analogous to all those things. Okay. So now, so I started with a with an elliptic operator and then suddenly moved on to diffusion. So what is the connection? So the connection is this. Basically, so the generator, so given a Markov process, there is something with a generator of that Markov process. So <coughs> the generator of that Markov process is given by this. So now if f is a locally bounded Borel measurable function and which is also bounded below, then we refer to such a function as potential. And then if we look at this operator LF, this is the operator we started with, which is just the generator of this 
diffusion, non-degenerate diffusion plus the potential. And by an eigenpair of LF, we mean such a pair, psi comma F, where psi is a positive function in some space. Don't bother, it's the subloop space. And lambda belongs to R, so that satisfies this eigenvalue equation, fine? So that's what we mean by an eigenvalue pair, where this psi has to be positive, fine? And we refer to lambda as the eigenvalue, psi as the eigenfunction. Now, given an eigenpair psi comma lambda, the associated twisted diffusion y, so what is this twisted diffusion? So it's an Ito process, as in 0 0.2, so it's a stochastic differential equation, solution of a stochastic differential equation, but now the drift instead of b is replaced by this, where psi is the eigenfunction. So when lambda is the, is equal, okay, so first of all, from where is this diffusion coming? Again, I'll not be able to say completely, but this diffusion, so if you actually, so this has a control theoretic interpretation. So if you start with that as a control problem of the SD we started with, then this diffusion comes up as some optimally controlled diffusion in a control problem. So this, this is not coming from thin air, but this has some control theoretic interpretation, but we'll not get into much detail of that today. Okay, so now when lambda is equal to lambda star, the principal eigenvalue, the eigenfunction is denoted by psi star and it is called the ground state. And the corresponding twisted diffusion, which we'll denote by again y star, is referred to as the ground state diffusion. Again, this ground state terminology has most probably come from physics, but I don't know the physics behind it, so it's, I've just taken the name. So ground state and ground state diffusion, so it's the uh, principal eigen function corresponding, uh, the principal eigen function and the twist state diffusion corresponding to the principal eigen function, okay? So now here, I, as I said, like mm, this eigenvalue problem for the bound, for bounded domain with the Richter boundary condition is pretty well known like many things are known, so here this lemma kind of summarizes known results and results which we'll be needing. So again, so suppose r is some number between zero to infinity and you are looking at the Dirichlet eigenvalue problem on br, then it says that there exists a unique solution, so unique up to this normalization because we know if something is an eigenfunction, then constant time that is again a eigenfunction, so this normalization makes it basically unique. So <clears throat> such that, again, it is strictly positive in the interior of the ball, again, BR is the ball of radius R, zero on the boundary, and it satisfies this eigenvalue equa equation almost everywhere on BR, fine? Now, this lambda hat R has this following properties. So as I said, in bounded domain, there is exactly one lambda at r which has a positive eigenfunction. So this is the principal eigenvalue in the bounded case. So lambda hat r has this following properties. First of all, this r going to lambda hat r is continuous and strictly increasing. And its dependence on the function f, so you can also think of it as a function of f. Again, lambda hat r is non-decreasing, convex, and Lipschitz continuous on, so you are thinking of it as a function of f and put the L infinity norm. So with Lipschitz constant one, and also, although I say is non-decreasing, but this last sentence tells you like if f is strict, then this, it is actually strictly increasing, right? So these are properties that's known for bounded case. Now let f be a potential. So I said like there is this continuum of eigenvalues, we define the uh, minimum to be the principal eigenvalue, but here you see like I have put in a different definition. So what I say is that the principal eigenvalue lambda star on RD, so we'll define lambda star to be the principal eigenvalue on RD of this operator LF by taking this limit and this limit exists because just in the previous slide we saw this lambda hat R is increasing, so we can do that. Now why are we doing this? Like. First of all, say, okay, first question is, well, there is an accepted definition in PD. How does this compare with that? And again, why 
on earth i am taking such another uh, such a definition which is different now say like if we define it in this way there are many properties which we can straight away say for lambda star for example limit of convex function is convex so this lambda star will also be convex and at least i will be able to say that this lambda star is non decreasing although i will not be able to say strict monotonicity but just by using these properties of the pre limit we can say such things for the principal eigen value on the entire domain rd right so now this as i said like i have already said this but here i have put it more mathematically so this is the except like commonly used definition in pd literature for the principal eigen value so this is the infimum over lambda belonging to r says so that this is a uh, this phi again belonging to some space is a super solution and the infimum of that you say this is the principal eigen value so this is one definition we can which is there in pd and here is like we are making an alternative definition so obviously how whether they agree or not is a first valid question so now this is a lemma again this first part is so this eigen value corresponding to the bounded uh, uh, so the eigen principal eigen function corresponding to the bounded domain has a stochastic representation so just a bit clarification so this tau n is basically the exit time of the ball of radius n and this tau r check is basically the hitting time of ball of radius r and br closure is contained in bn so this is true for all you take any r this is true for all n sufficiently large because your br closure should be inside bn and all so this stochastic representation holds we will see that such a stochastic representation will turn out to be very useful in the entire like in in rd but we it's already known that uh, such a stochastic representation holds for uh, bounded domain and also it holds that this definition which we made in terms of limit of eigen values of uh, bounded uh, those eigen value problem on bounded domain that is actually equal to the definition existing in pedri literature so things agree no issues okay so now another so important thing which is strict monotonicity so let's see be the space of all continuous uh, non negative continuous functions vanishing at infinity now we consider this two properties of lambda star f remember i said like it's known like it's known from the work of berestiki and rossi that the strict or monotonicity in terms of the function doesn't hold for unbounded domains in general so strict monotonicity at f if for some h in c0 plus of rd we have this lambda star of f minus h is strictly less than lambda star f and we say strict monotonicity at f on the right if this happens now lambda star is already a convex function of f that is known because it is a limit of convex function now by convexity is it is to say because once a convex function start increasing it has to remain increasing that p2 implies p1 so if it is strictly monotone strict monotonicity at f on the right then it is strict monotone fine so p2 implies p1 so we define these two properties again so i have just put it so this is the twisted process corresponding to an eigen pair psi lambda of lf so it is defined by this solution of this sde again this sde is a nice solution and all so again i have just repeated so twisted process corresponding to the principal eigen pair is called the ground state process and the eigen function is called the ground state so another definition just exponentially ergodicity so the process so this original diffusion is said to be exponentially ergodic if for some compact set b and delta greater than 0 we have this so again exponential means so till positive recurrent was the mean heating time was finite now it's like the heating time has some exponential moment that's exponential ergodicity again for degenerate diffusions if it happens for some non degenerate diffusion if it happens for some compact set it will happen for all and all so those sort of sort of things are there so that's the definition of exponential ergodicity that it has a finite exponential moment so now this is the first theorem main theorem so <coughs> it says so it gives a series of results so first of all it says that 
the ground state process is recurrent if and only if the principal eigenvalue is monotone at f on the right. So in general, it may not because I, as I said that uh, in general, the strict monotonicity is not true. So it gives a relation between strict monotonicity and this recurrence transients of the ground state diffusion. So what it says is that the ground, huh? It's like lambda star f is strictly less than lambda star f plus h, where h is from c0 plus. h is from c0 plus, fine? Yeah. So, in, if the ground state process is recurrent, or the two state diffusion is recurrent, if and only if this lambda star f is strictly monotone on the right, and in which case the principal eigenvalue is also simple, like we have in case of bounded domain, and this ground state psi star satisfies this kind of a stochastic representation, which is, you see this stochastic representation is very, very crucial to things that we have proved in this paper. So it's an like in, infinite analog of the stochastic representation that was true for <coughs> principal eigen function for bounded domain. Now the ground state process is exponentially ergodic if and only if lambda star f is strictly monotone at f and for any lambda greater than lambda star f, the twisted process is transient, right? So this gives like a kind of behavior like what you can expect for the twisted diffusion corresponding to the, or the ground state diffusion. So if you look at a, uh, any twisted diffusion corresponding to lambda greater than la the principal eigenvalue, the process is transient. Now, the ground state can be anything. So it says if lambda is greater than, it's always transient. But now for the ground state, the twisted or the ground state diffusion can be anything. It can be transient. It can be recurrent. It can be exponentially ergodic depending on all this. So it is recurrent but not uh, exponentially ergodic if it is just monotone at the right but not monotone, on, like strictly monotone. And like, so all these are, or if it is not at all monotone at the right, then it will, the ground state diffusion will be transient and all. So uh, that's the situation for ground state. So that's, so it basically like gives relations between strict monotonicity and properties of uh, the ground state diffusion. Okay. So now there was this another concept introduced by Rospensky in 1995. So we define this Green's measure, G lambdas, for every lambda in R, define this thing. So it's a measure, so measure, like if you can just say what this measure is when you integrate out with respect to all CC plus, so it's like specifies the measure. So the density of the Green's measure with respect to the Lebesgue measure is called the Green's function. Now, Pinsky used this existence of Green's function and Green's measure in his definition of what he called this generalized principal eigenvalue of lambda f. So according to his definition, a, lamb, a number lambda belonging to R is said to be subcritical if G lambda possesses a density, so there exists a Green's uh, function, critical if it is not subcritical and this eigenvalue problem has a positive solution and it's said to be supercritical if it is neither sub nor subcritical nor critical. So that's definition due to Rospinsky and he uses it for his definition of what is called generalized principal eigenvalue. Now one of the results due to Pinsky is that like this under regularity assumptions on the coefficients, so remember that's one, so why I, that's why I call it a generalization, our coefficients there is very less like b is just measurable and lambda has to be just locally Lipschitz, so there is no higher regularity assumptions. But <coughs> what Pinsky showed is that with some regularity assumption on the coefficients that this critical eigenvalue is always simple. Now this lemma generalizes one of, uh, so this thing due to Pinsky, and also it is giving a very nice characterization of how to recognize whether a given eigenpair is principal eigen, like principal or not. So it says that the following are equivalent. 
Suppose the twisted process y corresponding to an eigenpair is recurrent. That is if and only if g lambda g is infinite for some g or in other words the Green's function will not exist. If and only if this stochastic representation, this psi has this stochastic representation and if any of this is true in all this like you say some, these sums can be for some open ball for some g can be replaced by all, that's no big deal. And in, if any one of this one, two, three holds, then lambda is simple, fine, okay. So that means, so, huh? no that's what like recurrent will give you as I said like the previous theorem if it positive recurrent does, so it's recurrent and exponentially recurrent is in that scale. So like the way to look at this result is now suppose I give you an eigen pair and suppose you can somehow, somehow show that either that say you can show that this twisted diffusion is recurrent then clearly you can say that it is the principal eigenvalue because that we already know if lambda is greater than lambda star then it has to be transient or somehow so this is again easier to prove by taking limits of uh, bounded domain thing that if you can somehow show that your eigen pair, uh, this eigen function has this stochastic representation then you can straight away say yes this is the principal eigen uh, pair and also this lambda is simple. So which will tell that this psi is unique up to a constant, right? So that's the thing and also it uh, like uh, says that uh, what uh, Rospinski showed that if it is critical, so critical means at least some one such thing has to be infinite, then if it is critical then it is indeed simple. So it also like kind of reproves Pinsky's result but here it's in a more general setting because as I said in Pinsky's case you need regularity assumptions on the coefficients but here you need much less regularity assumptions on the coefficients. Okay, okay but before moving on so just one more thing I would like to say so that is one so again so this kind of this saying something about this ground state diffusion when it will be whether it will be recurrent, transient, all such things have also been studied in a paper by like two papers actually, Hsu and Case and Ichihara. So <clears throat> where they don't go to this strict monotonicity but again like when they say things about what will happen to this ground state diffusion but again in here their coefficients are need regularity assumptions and they are proof where they use gradient estimates from PD and all. So there they need these regularity assumptions. So in our case we don't need and why, so again first of all, so again we have been able to remove those regularity assumptions, that's one thing but also why removal of this regularity assumptions was key in our case because we also want to use this for control purpose for application in risk sensitive control and when again when you in this coefficients you put in this control thing th that is always measurable. So although if you originally start with B which has some regularity assumptions when you plug in the control it loses all the regularity. So doing away with regularity is also very very important from control theoretic point of view, okay. No, now some sufficient conditions for strict monotonicity. So we have seen that strict monotonicity, if strict monotonicity implies such and such things, now are there some conditions under which we can verify whether the strict monotonicity of the principal y in value <coughs> is there or not. So for that we also define one more quantity in this way which we call the risk sensitive average of f. So that's this definition, lim sup of e to the power so on. And so we can introduce this one hypothesis that there exists a lower semi-continuous imp compact function L from Rd to 0 infinity for which the risk sensitive average is finite. So if you have this hypothesis then this theorem it says that if you assume H1 and suppose that F is a potential such that this L minus F is in compact what it basically means is <coughs> say in words that this 
if uh, the rate of growth of f at infinity is lower than l, so then for any continuous h, you have this, or in other words, you have the strict monotonicity of the principal eigenvalue, and also this principal eigenvalue is e equal to this risk sensitive average for every x. So now this principal eigenvalue, and so there is one more connection between this principal eigenvalue and this risk sensitive average given any f. So it says that this holds and also this principal eigenvalue is equal to the risk sensitive average. Now another condition for verifying strict monotonicity is that, so suppose you have some script v in this space such so that it's strictly bounded away from zero and satisfying this kind of a Lyapunov condition for some compact set k and positive constants k0 and gamma. And if f is a non-negative bounded measurable function, satisfying this that the limb soup is less than gamma, then again monotonicity holds and the principal eigenvalue is equal to the risk sensitive average. So these are in two different settings, like so again, in some settings you can verify this, in some settings you can verify the previous one. So these are two sufficient conditions for uh, strict monotonicity to hold. Sorry. Okay, so now we move on to the application of this thing to risk sensitive control. So again, instead of diffusion, now we have a control diffusion where u is the control process taking values in a compact metrizable space, capital U, and we will say this, our set of admissible controls will be, again, so it's some, again, a pretty standard condition in uh, control theory. It says that your control should not anticipate the future Brownian increment, so that's the non-anticipativity condition. And so in control, there is always something called the running cost function. So we'll take our running cost function from this class. So C is continuous on RD cross U, non-negative. And it is locally Lipschitz in X uniformly with respect to U. So we'll, C will be act as the running cost function. So what is the control problem? So it says, like for any admissible control, define this risk sensitive objective function and also define this lambda star x, which is the, the optimal risk sensitive average, right? So that's, so basically, this is the objective function that you are trying to minimize over all admissible controls u. Now, a special kind of control is what is called a stationary Markov control. So stationary Markov control is a measurable map from Rd to u will denote by USM the class of all stationary Markov control. So what is this stationary Markov control? So basically your UT is of the form U of XT. So the control you choose is based on the current state. So it's called a stationary Markov control because under such a control, the, again, the control diffusion becomes, becomes a Markov process and all. So it's, that's why it's called the stationary Markov control. Now we say, as again, why this importance? You can clearly see because it's like very easy to implement such controls. Just look at the state and choose your control. So we say that a stationary Markov control is optimal if this minimum is achieved at one such control as at that particular <coughs> stationary Markov control. And we let the set of all such optimal controls define it by U star of SM, right? So this U star of SM is the set of all um, optimal stationary Markov controls. Again, right now we don't know whether this set is empty or not, but if there is such, we will denote the collection of all such by U star of SM. So now first assumption is like, again, this <coughs> is what is called uniform exponential ergodicity. So suppose there exists an incompact function L and a positive function script V satisfying again this kind of a Lyapunov condition. So again, you can see like, so this is again, the way you should think of it is like this is again, we are, all these assumptions are to ensure strict monotonicity. So this is kind of analogous to the first hypothesis that we had for strict monotonicity. So again, is, this is not a kind of vacuous condition. So there are indeed examples where such a condition is satisfied. For example, here is one such 
instance, like I should mention here, like this kind of a condition was actually used by Fleming and his co-authors in one of the pioneering papers of uh, risk sensitive control in diffusions. It is one of those very um, earlier papers on risk uh, sensitive control of diffusions. And there he used this alpha to be equal to two and took this sigma to be identity. So here is a condition which satisfies, like here is an instance which satisfies his assumption one. Now, we introduce this class of running cost function like this. Again, this should remind you of, as I said, the hypothesis. There are also this potential. So here, the role of potential is being played by this C function. So if it grows, if L minus this is in compact, again, C can grow, but its growth should be slower at infinity as compared to this L. So suppose this assumption holds and C belongs to this class C L, then this lambda star, first of all, it says that we saw this initially, this risk sensitive, optimal risk sensitive average can depend on x, but it says that it doesn't under the assumptions. And there exists a positive function satisfying this kind of a non, so it is basically the controlled version of the eigenvalue problem we started with. In addition, if you take some u bar, so what is this set? which denotes the class of all stationary Markov controls, which is obtained from this minimizer. So, so then, this u bar, so these minimizers are actually optimal stationary Markov controls. So now we actually know this u star is not empty. So if we look at this, so again, if we look at the minimizer, um, a measurable, so again, you need to use some measurable selector theorem and all. So if you look at a stationary Markov control, which is given by this kind of a minimizer, then such stationary Markov controls are optimal. And for them, again, this, what is the optimal cost? Optimal cost is basically the principal eigenvalue corresponding to that CV, where CV of X, CV of X is just C of x, vx, where v is that minimizer. So that, moreover, if you are given any optimal stationary Markov control, so it says a minimizer is an optimal stationary Markov control. What this b says is that if you are given any optimal stationary Markov control, then it is necessarily a minimizer. So it, it's that's how it like that stationary mark of control, you can think of it as a minimizer. And also, this solution of this thing, we said that V is one positive solution. It is unique up to a positive constant. If you, so if you say, like, it has to be one at zero, then there is actually a unique positive solution. So that's the application. So again, all this, so this uniqueness, so basically what you, the proof is basically showing that it is the eigenfunction corresponding to a principal eigenvalue and so hence unique and all. So that's the proof. And again, in that proof, that stochastic representation is very, very important. That's how we say that it is the principal eigenpair, fine? Now, the existence of a, such an incompact L as in assumption one is not possible when A and B are bounded. Now, so there is an alternative assumption. So this you should think of as corresponding to the second assumption I had for sufficient condition for monotonicity. So if there exists a function v satisfying this with this Lyapunov condition, and again, limb soup is less than this. So such a condition in risk sensitive control is referred to as a small cost condition. So if you have this condition, then again, you have an analogous theorem. So if sigma and b are bounded, then you'll also have to take your cost necessarily to be bounded and not just bounded, it should satisfy this kind of a thing, so this small cost condition. But if your uh, sigma and b are not bounded or at least b is not bounded and it satisfies the condition of the previous assumption, then you can allow your cost function to grow. It can be an in unbounded cost function, but again, there is a restriction on how fast it can grow, it, it has to grow slower than L near infinity. 
So these are the two theorems. So basically two same theorems, but in two under two different assumptions. And this, as we saw, like why the second assumption is needed, because assumption one need not be, need not hold when we are in uh, this uh, bounded setting. So <clears throat> that's the thing. Okay, so all those what I said is basically a part of this paper. So although I, I didn't mention all these uh, references properly, so you'll get all these references in here. So <clears throat> since I have four minutes, I'll just give one example. So I, again, I said this right monotonicity and strict monotonicity. I said strict monotonicity implies right monotonicity. But the other way, I didn't say anything. In fact, it's not true. So I should actually give an example where it is strictly monotone. Uh, it's monotone at the right, but strict monotonicity does not hold. So it's a very simple example. So suppose you take your L to be equal to delta, the Laplacian. So this is basically the generator correspond in, say, D is equal to 2. So this is basically the generator corresponding to a two-dimensional Brownian motion, fine. And we know in two-dimension Brownian motion is recurrent, but not exponential. It's just non null recurrent. Forget exponentially uh, ergodic and all. It's null recurrent. It's not even positive recurrent. So now how am I going to use this? Now, look at this. So take your potential to be equal to 0, fine. Now, it can be shown that if we look at the risk sensitive average, so epsilon f is actually equal to lambda star f under some assumptions and f equal to 0 uh, satisfies that. So if f equal to 0, what will be the risk sensitive average? Remember, it was 1 over t, lim soup, e to the power, that thing. So if you put f equal to 0, this will actually be equal to 0. So the in, if f equal to 0, L is your delta, the principal eigenvalue is actually 0. So once the principal eigenvalue is 0, so what is the principal eigenfunction? It will be some constant, so we can take it as 1, right? Now, remember in that what we did, we did uh, uh, log of this and took a grad, whatever you do, so the twisted diffusion will again be this thing. So the twisted diffusion corresponding to the principal eigenpair uh, uh, or the ground state diffusion corresponding to this L and this potential is actually this Brownian motion. So now it, you know that it's recurrent. So that means lambda star is monotone at right at zero. Because it is recurrent, if you use that theorem, so it has to be monotone at the right. But because it is not exponentially ergodic, not strictly monotone. So it's not monotone at the left, if you want it like that. So it is possible that it is monotone at the right, but not strictly monotone. And from this example, we can give another example also. Like we saw this, I said this ground state diffusion can be anything, it can be transient, it can be recurrent, it can be uh, exponentially ergodic. Now, let us take any f belonging to C0 plus, so continuous function with uh, non-negative continuous function vanishing at infinity, so this C0 is vanishing at infinity. Now, if you look at lambda star beta f, or uh, like if you look at the potential as beta f corresponding to beta less than 0, then the ground state diffusion corresponding to all these are transient. And if you take similarly beta greater than 0, then they are all exponentially ergodic. So basically, for beta equal to 0, it's recurrent beta less, so beta equal to 0 is f equal to 0. So beta equal to 0 is recurrent or null recurrent. 
So <coughs> beta less than zero is all transient, and beta greater than zero is all exponentially ergodic. So for the ground state diffusion, all three things are actually possible. So I'll stop here. Thank you.